Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Tuesday, September 10th, 2013, Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting. We're going to have, start with a flag salute led by Supervisor Gould. This is the portion of the meeting where we'll have the statement of meeting procedures read by our clerk. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, September 10th, 2013. Agendas are available on the wall outside this meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. There's a three minute time limit per speaker. The board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. When you speak, clearly state your name and address for the record. All items on the agenda will be open for the public to address before final action is taken. There is a three minute time limit per speaker which will be monitored by a timer on the podium. If there is a person speaking on behalf of a group with no other testimony from another member of the group, please identify yourself as such and your time may be extended at the pleasure of the board. Keep in mind that the chairman has discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. It is requested that cell phones be turned off or put in the silent mode. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, Ann. Now is the time for public comment. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board on any item that is not on the agenda? Now is the time to come forward and state your name. Seeing none, we'll move on to supervisor committee reports. Any committee reports? I don't see any. I do have one. Um, <coughs> supervisor Euler and I serve on the Transportation Planning Agency. And uh, in 2005, a Transportation Equity Act was passed. And part of that act was $61.1 million of uh, an earmark, federal earmark, now called congressionally directed funds for the I-80 bottleneck improvement project. Retired Congressman Doolittle was able to secure those for us. Uh, we get leveraged those funds with uh, Proposition 1B funds and some ITIP funds, which is regional, uh, regional transportation improvement program funds, and uh, did the three phases of the Interstate 80 bottleneck. It's very nice to say that now we have $9.3 million uh, unspent funds from that project. They have to be spent on uh, projects related to I-80 improvement, and there's uh, three projects that the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency staff has identified. Uh, one is the <clears throat> I-80 Auxiliary Lane uh, eastbound between State Route 65 and Rockland Road. Another is I-80 Auxiliary Lane westbound between Douglas and Riverside. That's always been a kind of a problem. And then Supervisor Euler's favorite pro project, I-80 State Route 65 interchange improvement. So uh, <clears throat> uh, planning agency staff will be working with Ca California Transportation Commission and with Caltrans to leverage those funds to further improve Interstate 80. So anyhow, that was good news. And that concludes my report. Consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda that the board members wish to pull off for discussion? Yes, I actually need to pull um, item <clears throat> 11D. This is the consent item relating to the Forest Hill uh, Veterans Hall Board appointments. Okay. Uh, that's 11D? D is in David, yes. Okay. Any other items wish to be pulled by the board members? Anybody in the audience want to pull a consent item off the agenda for discussion? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for approval of the remaining items. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move the item with the exception of 11D. Will the clerk please call the roll? Duran? Yes. Wygant? Yes. Euler? Montgomery? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Thank you. Now we'll bring uh, 11D forward. Supervisor Montgomery. Thank you. Yes. Um, I pulled uh, consent item 11D only because 
Um, one individual's name who was intended to be appointed today was inadvertently left off the appointment, and so I wanted to add Stephen Canizaro, representing the American Legion Post 587, to the existing appointments, which would be um, Francis Steve Stevenson, Joe Rako, Rich Murray, Keith Light, Gary Oliver, and Vincent Robinson. So it's just uh, adding one board member whose name was, or one hall board member whose name was inadvertently left off. All right. And we've run it past county council. It is appropriate to add it at this time. Okay. So move that we uh, adopt um, or approve the appointments of uh, Francis Stevenson, Joe Rako, Richard Canizero, Rich Murray, Keith Light, Gary Oliver, and Vincent Robinson. It's been moved and seconded to move the item 11D with the uh, amendments. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, yeah. Thank you, Supervisor effort. Montgomery. Now we'll move to department item, uh, item three, administrative services, procurement, uh, bid multi-department. Mr. Manning and Mr. Wood. Morning. Good morning, Chairman Holmes, su Supervisors. Item 3A is a request to both reject the award of bid number 10289 to John L. Sullivan and then reaward that same bid to winner Chevrolet of Elk Grove for the purchase of 13 Chevy Tahoe vehicles and to add two additional vehicles to that bid also to purchase from winner Chevrolet of Elk Grove. With me is Mr. John Manning, and he'll be presenting the balance of the item, and then we'll be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Good morning. On August 20th of this year, your board approved the award of competitive bid number 10289 to John L. Sullivan Chevrolet of Roseville. Shortly after the August 20th meeting, John L. Sullivan Chevrolet requested that their bid be withdrawn due to the fact that they are unable to complete the transaction. We contacted the next lowest bidder, Winter Chevrolet of Elk Grove, who confirmed that they are able to fulfill the county's orders. We also received a request from the Sheriff's Office to purchase two additional uh, Chevrolet Tahoe two-wheel drive police pursuit vehicles. The provisions of bid number 10289 allow for the county to purchase additional vehicles up to 120 days after the bid is awarded. The Sheriff's request is included in this item for your board's approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Supervisor Durant. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, with, with this change in positioning and the bidder, do you anticipate any, were there any other bids and do you anticipate any protests as a result of the awarding to the next, um, the lowest bidder? We don't anticipate any protests. Uh, John L. Sullivan was very forthcoming with uh, acknowledging the fact that they weren't able to complete the transaction, and the next lowest bidder is very willing and uh, ready to complete our uh, orders. So I don't foresee any uh, protests coming at this time. Has there been any requests to rebid uh, because of the fact that you're adding another two vehicles? No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from board members? Is there anyone in the audience wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Move approval. It's been moved to seconded to approve item three, administrative services procurement. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll now move to item four. Health and Human Services, Adult System of Care, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Ms. Bauman and Mr. Knick. Good morning. I'm to bring forward to you today for your consideration two grants to provide over $700,000 in funding to Placer County for housing for persons who are homeless. These grants are funded through HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, the two grants require two actions. One is to receive funds for the Permanent Supportive Housing Program. That's for $388,270,000. It will require a county match of $77,777. And the second grant is for Shelter Plus Care, a grant of $315,084 with a county match of $15,000. 
The HUD permanent, actually both of these grants really provide subsidies for people to live independently in the community and receive supportive, um, supportive services in addition to that. One grant actually pays for the supportive services, the permanent supportive housing program, and the other grant uses those services as match for the grant. So they are just slightly different financing strategies but similar programs. Um, I would mention that the federal program has changed from the McKinney-Vento Act to the Homeless Emergency Assisted Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing, now called the HEARTH Act. And as a result, we have changes in funding, match requirements, and funding program activities. But the good news is that these also brought a change of $88,000, almost $89,000 to the Permanent Supportive Program, and also $24,000 to the second program. So increases in federal funds, which is always a good thing. Um, the, the grant, uh, the match funds are included in the budget. Uh, because it's going to go between two fiscal years, the match funds are budgeted this year in the amount of 60479 and next year will be requested in the 1415 budget for 45370 Just a few highlights. Uh, 34 single adults and seven families were served in the supportive housing program. Um, they are able to stay as long as they wish, which really helps for success in this program. And we do target people that have mental health issues. So it's homeless is a requirement of HUD, but our particular programs target mental health issues. And the Adult System of Care has been running these programs since 2003 and 2004. Um, the second grant um, served 45 adults and 11 children, and more than half that left left for permanent housing situations. So again, we feel like we are doing a good job in getting people uh, stable into the community, which also, um, you know, really assists the county, helps the people individually, but keeps them from impacting our systems by having stable housing. Um, so with that, I would recommend approval and would be happy to answer any specific questions. Supervisor Euler. Yeah, Marie, my questions are in regard to the um, the folks transitioning out of needing this kind of assistance, and it, it doesn't. I'm wondering how the the what appears to me anyway to be a relatively low rate of folks transitioning out of needing this assistance. How it kind of compares? Do we know how it compares universally to other programs that are being run? I mean, we have. 34 adults that were serving and only three of them transitioned to full independent living. 12 families, two transitioned to independent living. I, I would think that we would, what are we doing to encourage that transition to assist with that? Are we, are, do we have programs that assist with checking on employment status and those other kinds of things that, that move people out of, I mean, because this should be temporary, and yet where our average length of stay is four years. Right. So let, let me just clarify a little bit in terms of the rules, because it's actually a federal program with spe specific federal rules, and one of the rules is that people can actually live in these living situations as long as they want or need to. Uh, we actually, in the early days, transitioned people out very successfully and had told us we couldn't do that that they had to be able to be stay. So we, uh, so anyway, so because <laughs> I, under, I understand too well what your point is and agree with you entirely, this particular program um, doesn't allow us to actually move pe people as quickly as we might want to. But we absolutely do help them. I mean, one of the ways to move out is just what you said, employment services. And so getting more money is really the way to be successful to get out of these programs. Some of these people um, might be on SSI and might not be able to actually get full employment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's sort of a case-by-case -case situation. But we definitely work to make sure that people are looking at those resources in terms of those programs. But we do have some restrictions because of the way the HUD program is set up. So, so help me understand. You said that, that previously we were transitioning folks at a, at a better rate, and HUD said we couldn't? We were really encouraging them. We thought a one-year program was a really good model. We thought we could be successfully moving them out, and they said that we couldn't put those kind of programmatic restrictions in the program that it wasn't allowed, that we had to really let them, you know, so we couldn't, we, you know, they, uh, we can encourage and, you know, whatever, but we couldn't actually have some expectation that they would be moved out. Quickly. So I have to imagine when folks were transitioning at a, at a higher success rate, we weren't throwing people out into the street, we were actually seeing the desired end result, and that was people moving to 
independent. What kinds of, of, of measures, what kinds of steps were we taking that we are no longer allowed to take or We had a specific, specific program requirement that they had a year, so it was a much more clear and programmatic direction, which helps motivate people to yeah. move more quickly. So that was probably the biggest difference. So again, I think we put in as much encouragement as we can. We definitely help people with resources, but it definitely slowed down in terms of the movement out of the program. I mean, the good news is that staying in permanent housing and subsidized um, situations with support is not a, a bad outcome in terms of the program. And so having some stability with that and not going back into the hospital, not going into incarceration, not having other kinds of outcomes as a result of mental illness that's not being treated appropriately is still, uh, you know, still a positive thing as well as substance abuse because these folks. When we had the, the faster transition, were the dollars available still fully subscribed? It again. When we had the faster transitions, when you had people moving out of the assisted and on to independent living, were we still spending all of the program dollars that were available at that time? So all this really means is that uh, fewer people are being served because they're staying longer and we have a greater, a, a longer list of people who are not being served because these folks aren't making the transition. Not as quickly, not as quickly. Now we have the other because, good news and with And that's the, because HUD came to us and said right. we were... Moving them too quickly, yes. Sorry. Unbelievable. Yep. Um, the only good thing, I mean, the good thing also is that with HUD, we have been able to really double this program in the last six years. So we are maximizing the federal funds the way they want us to do it, but we are able to serve more people because Sure, we're we spending more money on fewer people because now their length of stay is up to four years. And we think health care should be run by these people. But that, I digress. Okay, thank you. Do you feel better? I, oh. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I know a really good therapist. <laughs> Any other comments from board members? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. This is item number four. Uh, items A, 1, and 2, uh, Adult System of Care, Department of Housing and Urban Development Grants. It's been moved and seconded to move the item enthusiastically. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed or any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. We will now move to item 4. Uh, B, health, Children's System of Care, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services. Richard Connect presenting. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Holmes, members of the board. Richard Connect with the Children's System of Care. The uh, State Department of Health Care Services Mental Health Block Grant has, since 1994, funded a variety of mental health services in Placer County for both adults and children. In the last full year of completion, nearly 175 residents were assisted with housing and related supports, counseling or case management services, which provided a level of independence which helps them avoid hospitalization or other institutional settings. These services are among many which successfully leverage federal resources in ways that avoid county costs. This year's grant allocation is for $695,352. No county general funds are required, and I'd urge your support. Happy to take any questions. Any questions from board members? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board on this item? The board will bring it back for... Action. It's been moved in second to approve the item for health and human services, children's system of care, substance abuse, and mental health services. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. We'll now move to item five, public works, Auburn Folsom Road widening north phase, award of construction contract number 1151. Peter Kratz, good morning. Good morning, Chairman and members of the board. Uh, Peter Kratz with Public Works on Department Item 5. I have with me Matt Medill, Associate Civil Engineer and Project Manager for the project with Public Works. Um, he's going to give the formal presentation for this item. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, again, for the record, my name, my name is Matt Medill. Is this on? It's on. Yep, you're good. Okay, this item relates to the awarding the construction contract for the Auburn Folsom Road North Phase uh, Widening Project. This overall project consisted of three phases of widening Auburn Folsom Road from Douglas Boulevard to the Sacramento County line to connect to the, the Sacramento County improvements that continue that four-lane widening down to Highway 50. Uh, this project 
consist of 3,000 feet of improving Auburn Folsom Road. We will overlay the portion just south of Douglas. We will widen um, the last remaining two lane stretch just south of Eureka. We will be performing uh, or constructing drainage improvements. And also we have a cooperative agreement with San Juan Water District and we will be upgrading their water line as well in the contract. Uh, the final phase of this project will eliminate the current bottleneck and relieve the uh, traffic congestion. On the construction side, the engineer's estimate for construction was $7,730,000. Uh, we competitively bid this project with the Procurement Services Division and we received seven bids. Uh, Tykert was determined to be the lowest responsible, responsive bidder and the low bid was $5,643,196. This project is fully funded. It's partially funded by a grant we awarded the, from the state local partnership program. It's the last remaining dollars of the state Proposition 1B money. We, we were able to get a million dollars for this project. Also, it's uh, in February of 2012, the Board of Supervisors approved in advance they adopted a resolution to advance up to $7.7 .7 million in countywide traffic impact fees to take advantage of the current uh, historically low construction cost. We are scheduled to receive $8 million for Auburn Folsom Road from the South Plaza Regional Transportation Authority. And I just heard last week, I believe we're tentatively scheduled to begin reimbursement um, and we should be getting $1 million next year. The pro as far as environmental um, approval, the project final environmental impact report was approved on June 22nd, 2004. Um, and I'll wrap this up. Um, should the actions b before you be approved today, construction should start as early as next month. And it's uh, scheduled to take two construction seasons. So we're looking at uh, project completion in the fall of 2015. There will be seven stages of traffic control. We will be providing the public notice on our website and posting flyers in advance so folks will be aware of the upcoming traffic shifts. Uh, with the background information I've provided, the formal action we ask of you today is to pr approve three actions before you as stated in the board memo. In summary, they include Adopt a resolution awarding the construction contract to Tykert Construction. Two, is authorize the chair to execute the construction contract. And three, authorize the director of public works to execute contract change, order, change orders up to 10% of the construction contract amount. At this point, I'm happy to address any questions you might have. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Supervisor Euler has a question. Yes, okay. The Proposed uh, road overlay that's going to be a part of this on that portion of Auburn, uh, excuse me, yeah, Auburn Folsom, that's already four lanes. Will that overlay extend into the intersection of Auburn Folsom and Douglas where we have some pretty significant problems right there right now? And do we anticipate an overlay addressing those problems? We've got At this point in the, in the construction contract and in the drawings, we have extended it, I believe, to the north edge of the the handicap lane across the road. So it's just that, basically that fourth leg and doesn't extend north. Okay. But we can, I think if, with this if cost we savings. have the opportunity a, to take a look at that, the entirety of that intersection right now is, is really in bad shape. And last year some work was done on the uh, the northbound lanes as you turn off of Auburn Folsom to westbound Douglas um, to fix a rather significant depression that had developed there but uh, all through that intersection it's it's really deteriorated it's fairly substantially so yeah. we we actually are considering um, some areas as everyone's aware this is this project's been ongoing for <laughs> 10 years and the original plan was simply an overlay over that, that four-lane section. And the intersection was great. Everything looked good. Right. And now there's some areas where we're noticing um, a lot of wear and tear and some rutting. So there will be areas where we're going to do full-depth reconstruction. 
Okay. And we'll definitely look at the intersection as well. Thank you very much. Were you in high school when this project started? <laughs> no. Oh. no. <laughs> any other comments from board members? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. Move approval of item 5A, 1, 2, and 3. Second. It's been moved and second to approve item 5 5A, 1, 2, and 3, Auburn Folsom Road Widening, North Phase of Work Construction Contract Number 1151. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there any opposed or any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you. Aye. Well, we've got a few minutes to uh, fill our 930 timed item. I guess I move these things along too fast. So, anyhow, we'll meditate. If you wish. We'll take a five minute break. Thank you.
Everyone, the board will now reconvene to hear our 9.30 timed item, Health and Human Services Adult System of Care Annual Report, Older Adult Advisory Commission for Fiscal Year 2012-2013. Good morning, Ms. Bauman, Mr. Reed. Good morning again. So um, the Board of Supervisors did establish the Older Adult Advisory Commission in 2004 to provide a voice for older adults in county government and to advise the Board of Supervisors and the Department of Health and Human Services on matters related to the creation and delivery of services promoting the well-being and quality of life for older adults. Commission responsibilities do include submitting an annual report to the Board of Supervisors. So I'm happy to introduce William Reed. Uh, he has been the past chair of the Older Adult Advisory Commission and will just bring forward um, some highlights of the annual report um, that I believe you have received and it is with the clerk of the boards if you have not. Um, he has um, been the chair for 2011 through 2013. Um, he's really a person who is dedicated to older adult issues and has been a member of the California for Retired Americans for some time. So yes, over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Chairman Holmes and members of the board, thank you for taking this time this morning to hear about this year's activity related to the Older Adult Advisory Commission. My name is William Reed, and I'm the immediate past chair chairman of the commission. It is with pleasure that I present to you the commission 2012-2013 annual report. I would like to acknowledge Supervisor Holmes, the Board of Supervisors, the county CEO, as well as the Health and Human Services Director, Dr. Burton, and Adult System of Care Director, Maureen Boffman, for their support of the Older Adult Advisory Commission this past year. As I mentioned last year, and what is probably no surprise to any of us, is that by the year 2040, it is estimated that Placer will have 3.5 times the number of seniors there were here then we're here in 2000. The growth rate of 248%. That is 78% greater than the statewide estimate of 170%. For the most frail and vulnerable seniors, those 85 years old and older, who are the most of all elder care services, it is projected that the past in Placer there will be a six-fold increase during the same time period. This extraordinary growth in our senior population will create many new problems, but also many new opportunities for the Placer County. The OAAC is excited to be able to evaluate, advocate for solutions and innovations for seniors. With the support of this board, the Older Adult Advisory Commission, now in its ninth year, has been working to fulfill its mission which is to provide a voice for older adults and to advise the Placer Department of Health and Human Services and this board on matters relating to the creation and delivery of service that, services that improve the quality of life for older adults in Placer County. I am pleased on behalf of the Commission to come before you today to highlight a few of our accomplishments this past year. This year, as in past years, there continue to be an interest among Placer residents and the community in the work of this commission. We have many, we have had many guests visit our commission meetings. This past year, the board has been able to appoint a new, to appoint one outstanding new commissioner who is well qualified to represent the community and providers of services for the older adults. He is our incoming chair, chairman and someone familiar to you. Mr. Eldon Luce. <laughs> As always, we have been working on ways to expand the Commission visibility and to encourage public input. The Commission co-hosts with the Area for a Agency on Aging a town hall forum for seniors issues for Ju in July 2012. We have also continued to submit articles for publication written by our Commissioners to the Sun City News, the Forest Hill Messenger, the Auburn Centennial, and the Auburn Journal. We also continue to enjoy participation with our members, my the Board of Supervisors staff, a member, now an executive committee member, who is also a Colfax Max member, as well as the Area for an Aging. 
We have regular reports on activities from our members appointed to the Seniors Legislation and the Area 4 Advocacy Council, Advisory Council. Excuse me. This year, we have formed a committee to look at the unique needs of Placer County for senior housing. The committee will hear from speakers, analyze available data, research housing options, and be available to provide information and advocacy related to this important community need. This year, we toured Escaton and the Living in Place model homes there. We heard speakers from the Senior Peer Council, the Medicare Presentation, Senior Center Without Walls, the Housing Authority, the Placer Consumption on Homeless, and the Adult Protective Services, just to name a few. This was a fulfilling year for the Older Advi Adult Advisory Commission, and we look forward to another busy and protective year. On behalf of the Commission, I would like to thank you for, your, uh, for allows, allowing us to make this a short presentation, and we hope you enjoyed a review of our annual report. As I mentioned earlier, we really do appreciate your continued interest and support. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Any questions from board members? Seeing none, uh, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board on this presentation? Seeing none. Well, thank you. That was very informative. Uh, I hope you keep up the good work. I must uh, point out that my trustee aide, Ruth Alves, uh, uh, comes to your meetings quite often and keeps me informed of your prog progress. And I'm just pleased to see Eldon Luce uh, on the team. Uh, he has a good background in, uh, with our adult system of care. So thank you very much. And thank you all for your participation in providing information to the Board of Supervisors so we can better provide services for the senior community, which I happen to be one. So, so thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Green. You. Yeah, I think we'll run into uh, do a little closed session really quickly. I know you're all ready to go, but you know, time is time. Uh, so we'll be what? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, the board will now adjourn to closed session to discuss the items. Set out on the closed session agenda one item of existing litigation and two items of anticipated litigation. And we will return at uh, 9.45.
the third item uh, after the budget item. The board will reconvene and hear the uh, 945 timed item, item county executive budget. Mr. Andy Heath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, what I'd like to do for you this morning is bring to you for your consideration the uh, approval of the final budget for fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2013. As you might recall, on June 4th of this year, the board uh, approved a resolution um, adopting the preliminary fiscal plan, which is the proposed budget uh, for fiscal year 1314. And today's action will supersede that action and actually put in place a final spending plan for the fiscal year uh, beginning July 1st, uh, 2013. Today's uh, budget process, the, the final budget hearing that's being presented today differs a little bit uh, from the way it's been presented in the past, and that as opposed to working with two meetings to approve the final budget, we're trying to do this with one meeting, where we actually have the presentation of the final budget, uh, which I'll do in just a second, have the public hearing, and then subsequent to closing the public hearing, uh, approving all the related documents associated with the final budget. It's our intention to do that today. What I'd like to do is just kind of give you an idea of what we're asking for today. We're asking the board to receive an overview of the final budget uh, and then open the public hearing. After the public hearing is closed, uh, we'll ask the board to adopt a resolution for the fiscal year 13-14 final budget, uh, operating budget, which consists of 16 operating funds, totaling just under $721 million for this fiscal year. We'll also ask the board to approve the 13 fiscal year 13-14 final budgets for the proprietary funds, which includes 12 internal service funds and six enterprise funds, totaling just under $79 million. We'll ask the board to approve items on the county master fixed assets list for the current fiscal year 13-14. Uh, we'll ask the, we'll introduce an ordinance amending the personnel allocations for staffing uh, for, to various departments to reflect 13-14 position changes. And then finally, we'll ask the board to adopt a resolution for the fiscal year 13-14 final budgets as they relate to the board governed 167 special districts, uh, just under, uh, just over $49 million. To go through this today, what I'd like to do is kind of give you an overview of the budget development process and some of the key considerations that we use to develop that budget. Uh, give you an overview of the operating budget, focusing primarily on the county's general fund and the public safety fund and then give you an overview of the capital projects and public ways and facilities funds as well. Uh, and then we'll go into one other fund that is part of the operating budget, which is the library fund, uh, to kind of give you an update on the library fund uh, consistent with what was presented to this board at, at the final budget workshop on August 15th. Then I'll give you a brief overview of the proprietary funds, which are the internal service funds and the enterprise funds, special district fund budgets, and then we'll have any questions that you might uh, have and uh, convene the public hearing at that point. Looking at some of the key considerations that we used to develop the budget, one of the foremost things that we did was consider board policies and actions that promote fiscal sustainability moving forward. One of the things that we worked with was the board's direction to use the multi-budget framework uh, as we put together the budget, specifically for the general fund and the public safety fund, which make up the lion's share of the operating budget, at about 74 percent. Those funds uh, were put through the multi-year budget framework in the sense that we, are anti we look at what our anticipated revenue streams will be over multiple years and then counter that with what the anticipated expenditures were going to be, are going to be, uh, given certain cost drivers moving forward, where we know those cost drivers will exist, specifically as they relate to employee costs or salary and pension and any other costs related to uh, operating the county uh, in the operating funds. What this multi-year budget framework does is it points out systemic gaps uh, that may exist uh, in the future where there may be a funding hole. Um, this has become very important as the county strives to um, work towards the phased opening of the South Placer Adult Correctional Facility uh, in the near future, which is slated to open late spring of uh, fiscal year 2000, well, fiscal year, uh, calendar year 2014, um, and identifying any gaps associated with the ongoing sustainability of that facility. We also took into account a conservative approach to budgeting, which is one of your board policies. Conservative approach to budgeting allows us to address any economic issues that might come up, fluctuations in the economy um, that we have, uh, we all well know that uh, have existed in the last several years, that we may be able to address um, those issues by taking a conservative approach to budgeting and having 
that leeway built into the budget as we move forward on both the expenditure side and the revenue side. We also took into account uh, using only one time using one time revenues only for one time costs, where we're relying less and less on one time revenues, including carryover fund balance, for ongoing costs in our budget. And then finally, uh, one other board policy that we uh, achieved very at a very high level this year is providing flexibility to adjust to economic fluctuations, specifically future economic fluctuations at this point, by funding reserves. And I'll go through that a little bit on one of the slides that I have and how we have achieved a, a minimum target in, in one of your board policies. We also looked at infrastructure and investment planning, where we took the items that are listed in the Capital Facilities Financing Plan and some of the items discussed as part of the Infrastructure Investment Committee and looked at the priorities of those projects and funded those through both the Capital Projects Fund and the Road Fund. And then we also stressed an increased amount of communication as part of this budget process this year. Uh, there were several meetings that were held um, uh, for which communication took place. Uh, we had the um, Strategy and Priority Workshop that was held in February of this year, a Priority and Challenges Workshop that was held in February, in February of this year where departments discussed their priorities and challenges specific to their needs. Uh, we also had the multi-year budget framework, as I previously mentioned, as part of the fiscal sustainability represented to the board in March, where we updated that plan. Um, and then we had the final budget workshop in August, where as opposed to focusing so much on the fiscal attributes of the budget, we focused on the programmatic attributes of what the departments provide in terms of services and what the compelling public value of those services actually is. Budget also includes uh, in the proposed budget, which will come over to the final budget as well, some updated information with respect to increased demographic information and then a spotlight on critical issues where we're actually talking about some of the critical things that are going on in the county. Looking at the operating budget, which is the 16 main operating funds in the county, uh, the operating budget is a balanced budget. The county must bring a balanced budget uh, to, uh, must approve a balanced budget by October 2nd of each year consistent with the County Budget Act. Uh, you can see that the operating budget being forecasted for fiscal year 1314 is about $720.8 million, and that's down about $9.3 million from the final budget that was approved for fiscal year 1213. There's lots of changes in this budget. Uh, you can see that in the main funds, uh, the general fund, the public safety fund, and the capital projects funds, uh, th they have some increases, and I'll be going through those with you. Um, and then there is a decrease in the uh, Public Ways and Facilities with a Roads Fund of about $40 million, and I'll explain what, why that uh, transpired as well. But overall, about a $9.3 million decrease year over year in the operating funds for the county. This is just a pie chart that demonstrates where the majority of the uh, appropriations in the operating funds uh, are, are used. Uh, the general fund makes up about 54% of the budget, $387 million. Public Safety Operations Fund is second, uh, $148 million, or 20, just under 21% of the budget is spent there. Uh, and then we have the Capital Projects Fund and the Public Ways and Facility Funds at 10% uh, and 11% respectively. So about 95% of your budget is in these four funds, uh, which is a considerable amount. These are the position changes uh, that are coming forward uh, as part of the fiscal year 13-14 budget as compared to the final position changes approved uh, in fiscal year 12-13. If you look at the allocated positions, and these are the total positions that are allocated uh, by your board uh, to the departments in the county, um, not necessarily those that are funded, but those that are allocated. Uh, allocated positions have gone up 36 positions uh, year over year, and that can be pretty much attributed to the addition of 36 positions uh, as part of the uh, phased opening of the South Placer Adult Correctional Facility in the, in the um, public protection system uh, that you see there. On the funded side, funded positions have gone up 125 positions year over year. And again, this accounts for, again, the 36 positions that are part of the South Placer facility. And also it accounts for um, 99 positions that, 91 positions uh, in health and human services, where these positions were funded on three different occasions. 26 of these positions were actually funded at mid-year in 12-13. 18 of them were funded with the proposed budget when the proposed budget came before the board. And then another 47, uh, as was mentioned in the final budget workshop a month, a month ago, uh, are being recommended uh, for health and human services. 
All of these positions are as a result of the program expansions in the Health and Human Services Department related to CalWORKs, CalFresh, um, and some of the other Health and Human Services mental programs uh, that, that are experiencing uh, requirements, mandates uh, that are required uh, by the counties to provide. Uh, these, serve, these positions are 100% funded by federal and state sources. Uh, they're mandated positions and the county is required to, um, to have these positions in place. So that makes up the lion's share of the position changes on both the allocated side and the funded side. Looking at specifically the general fund, what I'll do is I'll go through the general fund and the public safety fund on both the sources side and the uses side. Looking at general fund sources, you can see that year over year from 1213 to 1314, general fund sources have gone up uh, about $17.6 million when you compare year over year. The peer sources, not including the carryover fund balance, have gone up just under $20 million. This $20 million increase can be primarily attributed to the federal and state program expansions, as I mentioned, in the Health and Human Services Department that are generating an additional 10, uh, just over $10 million uh, year over year. We also have some property tax increases at $5.2 million. Uh, these property tax increases are as a result of the increase in assessed valuation that's been experienced in the unincorporated area of the county. Uh, and the board should uh, exercise uh, cautious optimism moving forward in that although there is a, an increase in discretionary revenue like property tax and sales tax to some extent, um, whether or not these revenues will continue to increase remains to be seen uh, given what has been experienced over the last six years coming out of the, as we come out of the Great Recession. Transient occupancy taxes have also gone up uh, about $640,000, and this is just the general fund portion of the TOT. Uh, and then we have building-related activity related to construction permits and, inspe and inspection fees uh, totaling just under $700,000. So that makes up the majority of the $19.8 million. What I'd also like to point out is that on the sources side for the general fund, we did have a carryover fund balance of about $28.4 million coming into the general fund. Uh, at, the, uh, at the outset of fiscal year 13-14. Looking at how the general fund is lined up to be, uh, the sources in, in the general fund are lined up to be used, on the uh, financing uses and re reserve side, provisions for reserve side, we have an increase of about $17.6 million year over year, 12-13 uh, to 13-14. You can see that we are adding back just under $5.7 million to reserves. And the next slide I'll show you uh, what's happening with that. Uh, and then we have about a $17.2 million uh, increase year over year uh, on financing uses in the general fund uh, that, again, is made up of the uh, federal and state program expenses in HHS, where we have to spend the money that we're now bringing in um, on the source side. Uh, and then there are some salary and benefit and A87 cost increases of about $4.5 million built into the general fund. And we have an increased general fund net contribution to public safety fund uh, of about $2.1 million. Looking specifically at the $5.7 million that your board uh, during the um, August workshops uh, directed staff to fund into reserves, uh, you can see that um, what this chart depicts is the red line represents 5% of operating costs consistent with uh, those defined in the budget and finance policy. Um, uh, that basically states that it should be a, uh, a goal for the county to achieve a minimum 5% target uh, of uh, operating costs um, in their reserves and the economic contingency and the general reserve combined um, as we move uh, through the years. You can see that during fiscal year 2008-9 uh, and up until this year, uh, we were below that target. Uh, as we use those reserves uh, to counter the impacts of the Great Recession on the county to mitigate the levels of serve, to mitigate the decrease in levels of service that would be provided to the county residents and, and try to keep in, in trying to keep that level of service constant. Uh, given the opportunity to fund those reserves, however, this year, uh, your board directed to place those uh, additional $5.7 million into reserves where about 800,000 of those reserves went into the um, mandated cost, future mandated cost reserve, uh, unfunded mandated cost reserve for the Health and Human Services Department um, as that was just basically half of the additional money that we received for realignment related to HHS. And then the balance of that, about $4.9 million, did go into the economic contingency reserve. 
you can see that you are, uh, your board is now funded uh, at the 5% uh, level uh, moving forward. Moving on to the public safety fund, I uh, just wanted to give you an idea of similar to the general fund, what's going on in the public safety fund on the sources and uses side. Looking at public safety sources, uh, we have an additional $6.5 million coming into the public safety fund for this year. Um, of that $6.5 million, about 250000 of that is increased carryover fund balance from the previous year. Fund balance carryover was about $10.2 million coming into uh, fiscal year 13-14. And then there's about a $6 million increase in financing sources uh, coming into the public safety fund as well, uh, where there is a general fund operating contribution of about $2.9 million. Additional, uh, we have a pub Proposition 172 public, public safety sales tax amount that is increased by about $2.2 million. And then there's some additional AB 109 public safety realignment funding in the amount of $1.3 million that's coming in year over year. Focusing on the uses side for the public safety fund, you can see that uh, we are adding back uh, approximately $2.3 million back to the public safety reserve. Uh, that will be used for uh, future public safety priorities as identified by the board in the future. We also have a $5.6 million operating budget increase year over year from 12-13 to 13-14 um, as we move forward. Essentially all of that operating increase is tied up in the phased opening of the South Placer Adult Correctional Facility which is slated for again um, the late spring of 2014. And there's also some salary and benefit increases that are offset by an OPEB reduction, uh, countywide OPEB reduction. Uh, and some salary and supply savings uh, in that fund as well. One of the other special funds, or other, rev other special revenue funds in the operating budget that I'd like to call out to your attention is the county library fund. As I mentioned during the uh, uh, budget workshop on August 15th, the county library fund uh, may need some uh, additional review uh, when it relates to the strategic moving forward on the strategic plan for the library um, in terms of fiscal sustainability. The total county budget for 13-14 in the library is just under $6.3 million. This is about 2.6% more than the budget was uh, in 12-13. Most of that 2.6 increase can be related to one-time costs that were added between the proposed and the final budget uh, for uh, some upfront OPEB for three new hires. Uh, they're not new positions, they're just new hires, hires of three additional people at the library. And then some restored funding for library materials in tune of about $83,500, $83 which makes up a $20,000 grant uh, for some ebooks and an additional $63,000 uh, that will be available for additional library material that's coming from library fund balance. It, the library does anticipate uh, a use of $374,000 in reserves and fund balance combined during fiscal year 13-14, and it is estimated that approximately $458,000 in reserves will remain at the end of 13-14. Given the fact that the library continues to use reserves, uh, we are looking at the fiscal sustainability of the library in the context of what, it, what the future revenues will be uh, uh, put up against uh, the future costs, and that will be coming back to the board in the form of a workshop in, in the very near future. Looking at the capital and infrastructure funds, specifically in the operating budget, uh, the public ways and facilities, or the road fund, uh, and the capital projects fund, you can see that there is a very large change, about a $40 million um, decrease year over year uh, in the final budget from 12-13 to 13-14 for the road fund, approximately um, 80.9 80, $80 million is budgeted there. That decrease is due to a change in the budget approach uh, that is used for the road fund, whereby rather than budgeting the entire amount of the project or the entire anticipated amount in the project in one fiscal year, year after year, we're only budgeting what is anticipated to be spent in each fiscal year consistent with the revenues that would be received. So that's why you see a large adjustment there um, in that fund. We also have uh, the, uh, a decrease in the amount of money being funded for the Forest Hill Bridge Seismic Retrofit, which is uh, in its waning phases, um, that project's in its waning phases and is actually geared to be completed, I believe, this year. In the capital projects fund, we have about a $6 million increase year over year. And again, these are just capital projects that are budgeted for completion, uh, consistent with projects that are on a, a master list. 
just want to point out uh, some, some projects um, that make up these funds and just a random selection of projects. Uh, in the Road Projects Fund, uh, we have the Kings Beach Sidewalk, Forest Hill Bridge Seismic Retrofit, as I mentioned, and then the North Phase of Auburn Folsom Road Widening, which the board is very aware of. Uh, in the Capital Projects Fund, we have the Tahoe Justice Center, uh, we have SMD Number 3 Regional Sewer, uh, the Auburn Animal Shelter, and some improvements to the Saddleback Lift Station. And again, these are just a selection of projects from each fund, which has a list, three-page list of projects uh, within each of those funds, making up all of that final budget. Moving on to the Internal Service and Enterprise Funds, see that the county has 12 internal service funds. Internal service funds account for services provided to county departments. Um, most all of these costs are already allocated in the operating budget, so the internal service budgets as a whole are not really included as a budget to the operating budget, uh, but rather they are mentioned and they do need to be approved uh, as part of this budget process. There are 12 of those. Um, the largest internal service fund would be the Environmental Utilities Fund at $11.5 million. And the smallest internal service fund would be the state unemployment uh, internal service fund at about $865,000. And we also have six enterprise funds um, that the county uh, maintains. Uh, in those enterprise funds, the largest of those is the transit fund at about $10.5 million. And the smallest is the M Power, uh, Placer M Power Fund at about $488,000. So you can see you have a wide array of activity uh, in both of these. Uh, levels of proprietary funds, which are the internal service and enterprise funds. Your board also governs 167 special districts throughout the county. Uh, the total budget for those 167 districts is $49.4 million. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to just call to the board's attention, there is a schedule in your packet that is page 16 to the agenda. Uh, on page 16 of the agenda, uh, uh, schedule one, and it's only a one-page schedule, uh, the special districts and other agencies budget uh, under total financing uses is uh, there's an error in that number and you you do have the right number here which ties to the 49.4 million dollars just an inadvertent oversight no other schedules in the budget have been impacted by that it's just a schedule just wanted to call that to your attention uh, of that 49.4 million dollars you can see that i've listed eight noted districts and these eight noted districts make up approximately 77 percent of all of the $49.4 million budgeted for the 167 special districts. Uh, so these are the largest districts by, by appropriation. We have the sewer maintenance districts, sewer SMDs 1, 2, and 3 uh, that are built into those special districts. A couple of fire districts in North Auburn, Ophir, and Sunset West Fire. Uh, Dry Creek Park District, Dry Creek Watershed, and then the North Star Highland Parks and Recreation. Some of the smaller special districts that are governed by the board um, are have landscape and lighting districts, recreation districts, other transit districts, and road maintenance districts. So those are the types of things that are governed by these, or that are managed by these special districts. And that concludes the budgetary part of the presentation, just providing you an overview of what the budget looks like, uh, the final budget looks like as we move forward. At this point in time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have prior to opening the public hearing. Thank you, Andy. Uh, any questions, comments from board members? Just Supervisor to... Montgomery. Andy, thank you. Um, great, really, really good comprehensive overview. Um, back to sl slide number 14, please. Um, so I'm looking at the public ways and means of road, uh, public ways and facilities, the road fund, um, and seeing that, you know, almost $40 million decrease. I understand that that is because of the way that we're now calculating infrastructure expenditures. Can you shed any light on costs for maintenance, so um, upkeep of roads, snow removal, all of those sorts of things? How, how has that changed within this budget, or, or is it pretty much on par with last year? I'm not sure off the top of my head. Is... Um, I'll, I'll follow up with Ken Graham. Okay. Okay. on that but um, you know obviously since I represent the high Sierra snow removal and and road maintenance is always right. a huge issue um, not just with my constituents but with everyone who would like to go skiing and boarding and tubing and sledding um, so I, I will uh, follow up with Ken on that okay. thank you, that information to you. Supervisor Duran yes uh, thank you very much um, this is more for um, HHS I know that um, 
the governor's office uh, has uh, apparently resolved uh, some issues related to uh, additional release of prisoners and there may be some funding uh, coming back for rehabilitation purposes just wanted to put that on HHS's uh, radar screen to find out a little bit more about what uh, what would be coming back and what types of uses uh, those funds would be too because obviously that will impact this a little bit not in a negative sense but a positive sense Any other questions from board members? Um, actually, I, I see Ken at the back of the room, so hard maybe he can give us. I know he is hard to miss. He's <laughs> the tallest guy at the county, I think. And yet he tries so hard to be inconspicuous. <laughs> but I may need a repeat of the question. Ken, thank you. Uh, my question was really relating to uh, the almost $40 million drop in the road fund and understanding that most of that has to do with just how we are budgeting infrastructure projects. My specific concern is, um, what does this year's budget look like in um, in terms of maintenance and operations for for road um, maintenance and operations um, as compared with last year? Have we seen a decrease in that, or is it roughly the same? Actually, roughly the same. Most of our gas tax revenues that do most of our operations and maintenance have stayed fairly flat. Uh, the state has taken some actions to make sure our money is not going up, but they're also making sure it's not going down. The $40 million, although there are some changes to how we're budgeting, it's really about our capital improvement program, the projects that we're doing. Uh, and this whole idea that we get a lot of money coming in, but we can't possibly build all of those projects in one construction season. So 90 plus percent of that dollar volume has to do with capital projects for roads. Operations and maintenance, not going up, maybe not even keeping up with inflation, but it's relatively flat. So generally speaking, then we can expect to see about the same level of service for snow removal, um, road maintenance, all of that throughout. Absolutely. The big, I think the biggest change that's occurred over the last five years, and we've talked about it and I don't want to over harp on it, is our resurfacing programs, which we actually have dropped in the last four to five years. But as far as the people filling the potholes, doing the snow removal, cleaning the ditches, um, we have reduced the size of some of our crews. But I think we've kept, I hope, when we believe, we've kept a very similar level of service. Okay, thank you. And if I might, Mr. Chairman, in response to Supervisor Duran's question about um, changes at the state level that will have an effect on um, both our health and human services and our criminal justice uh, system, um, we expect to come back to this board in November with an update on the impacts of AB 109 realignment uh, on Placer County specifically. And at that time, we'd be happy to ad address and discuss uh, the different programs that are being funded uh, as we accept more and more of the um, state's responsibility for those um, uh, released or uh, uh, now uh, county retained uh, uh, inmates. Thank you. Okay, any more questions from board members? Seeing none, I will open the public hearing and take any testimony from any members of the public that wish to address the board on the final 12 th or 13 14 budget. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring back the item for discussion and action. Is there any more discussion? What, uh, does anybody want to do anything here? <laughs> I just uh, did want to add, I'm sorry, my, I did. Oh, I see. That was right there. Um, just an editorial comment. Uh, the most telling chart in all of this as we look at numbers and as, uh, as Art Laffer phrased, numbers that have 8, 9, and 10, and 11, and 12 digits as mega numbers, and if my eyes glaze over uh, when you see all those zeros. I think the most telling chart is the chart that uh, reflects what has happened with our operating reserves. And the fact that as a county, um, over the last three years, while other local jurisdictions are uh, just now getting around to trying to figure out what it is that they are going to do 
with um, that uh, escalating disparity between income and outflow, uh, we addressed that issue early on. We as a board set the policy, but you folks as staff carried it out. And it was difficult and it was challenging for our managers and, uh, and for our employees. And yet, at no time over the last six years as we've gone through this, with the exception of the occasional comment about a pothole here or there, which did get fixed, at no time did I hear comments or concerns from constituents about declining levels of service in Placer County. As a matter of fact, I think what we saw during this period was a number of press reports mostly focused on public safety comparing and contrasting Placer County versus Sacramento County or versus surrounding counties in terms of how we were addressing uh, issues of public safety and law enforcement in tough budget times versus how our neighboring jurisdictions were dealing with it. And so by comparison, Placer County was looking even better. And so while our board did set the policy, uh, did give the direction, it was all of our department heads, their managers, and their staff working in concert with our CEO's office to say, okay, now that the board has said this is the direction we're gonna go, how do we make it work? And you did it. And so thank you for all of the hard work that you've put in over the past several years to put us in this position. Because I can tell you we are probably the envy of California counties being in this kind of a position. And I think it bodes well for us as we move forward. So I just wanted to extend my thanks to, uh, to our staff, to CEO's office, to department heads, and to everybody who works in this county and delivers a high level of service and figures out how to make do with less and get more done. Thank you, Supervisor. Your that was very prophetic. And I, you know, I just have to tip my hat to our county department heads, all of our CEO staff, but particularly, you know, during the downturn, we were prudent with our, fortunately we had the general reserves that we canceled, um, but as we had our hiring freeze, all of those county employees rolled up their sleeves, didn't grumble, maybe a little bit, but they got the job done. They worked harder, they did more with less, and uh, it's been greatly appreciated, and as Supervisor you were so eloquently stated, I haven't heard that many complaints from my constituents and it's always a good uh, for us as electors to go out into the community. It's a good story to tell to the, the public, and uh, we're very pleased to do that. Supervisor Montgomery. Yeah, I just want to follow up on um, both your words and, and thank uh, the public, essentially, because it's all our tax dollars and their tax dollars that we're talking about um, utilizing here and balancing that income and that outgo. and. Um, you know, these past few years have not just been tough for us here at the institution of the county, but they've been tough for everybody in the county. And my uh, um, constituents, much like yours, Chairman Holmes, have been largely uncomplaining, understood the problems and the difficulties that we faced and have been very supportive of trying to figure out different and better and more effective and efficient ways of doing things with their own dollars and with county dollars, recognizing that county dollars are their dollars and our dollars. And so um, I think it's important in looking at this chart, which I agree with Supervisor Euler, this is the most important um, slide in this presentation from my perspective. Um, I think it's really important to recognize the public's piece of this and to recognize their understanding and their willingness to work with us to create a uh, strong and fiscally sound Placer County. So. My thanks to staff, but also to the public who have been so behind us all the way these past long five years. So thanks to everyone. Thank you. Uh, any more comments? Seeing none, we'll ask the board for action. Mr. Chairman, I would move uh, approval of the resolution adopting the fiscal year 13-14 final budget, move approval of the final budgets for the proprietary funds, approve the items listed under the county uh, master fixed asset list as well as move the introduction of the ordinance amending the personnel allocations for various departments to reflect the position changes approved in this budget 
and uh, that we also approve the resolution adopting the fiscal year 13-14 final budgets for our special districts. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to <coughs> move item two, the county executive budget item, uh, approving the 2013-14 final budget. All those in favor, please say, oh, this is a roll call. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mueller. Duran. Yes. Mike Ant. Yes. Montgomery. Yes. Holmes. Absolutely. The motion is passed. Thank you, everyone. And I think that concludes the uh, items uh, on yeah. our agenda. One more session. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the board will now adjourn to closed session to discuss the remaining item, anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, the board has now completed its discussion of all of the items listed on the closed session agenda. It, under existing litigation, the workers' compensation matter, the board gave direction to staff. Under anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, the board did, was advised of one potential case and gave direction to staff. In the initiation of litigation, the board uh, got a report and uh, gave direction to staff also. That concludes the closed session report. That concludes the items on the board agenda today.